the Indo-Pacific has evolved as a crucial theater for naval strategy for Japan, as well as the Quad countries like India, United States, and Australia. Today, to talk on this very relevant aspect, we have a very special guest, Vice Admiral Yoji Koda, who is a former Commander-in-Chief, Self-Defense Fleet, Japan. I welcome you, Admiral Koda, and thanks for taking out time for this session. I would now request Vice Admiral to begin his talk. Over to you, Admiral. Thank you very much, the Tiltoma Foundation, for providing me this opportunity to speak something on Japanese naval strategy. Yeah, and this is just a cover page, but in yes, in Japan, you know, the I think many of you know that Japan has one very unique uh, subject in security. That's the so-called pacifist constitution. So we always have to take into mind the fundamental thoughts of the pacifist constitution. So let me start with explaining the key elements of the Japanese security strategy under pacifist constitution. Yes. That is an alliance. And you know, the, I know the Indian is a non-aligned policy nation. So to some of you, it's a little difficult to really understand the real nature of the alliances, especially inviting foreign forces in my own soil. So keeping the foreign force in our country and maintain the security of Japan or in that country is very unique perhaps to many of the Indians. But to just as a beginning or first subject, let me touch upon the Japan-USA um, Japan alliances. As I mentioned, you know, due to Japan, Japanese pacifist constitution, Japanese military, we call the self-defense force, are not allowed to make a strategic strike operations against even the aggression nations. So on behalf of the Japan, the United States will be responsible for conducting the strategic strike over invading countries. So this is the fundamental part. And this in the mission sharing, we call the strategic mission sharing and typically represented by following three subjects. One is the USA or America will provide the nuclear umbrella for Japan. And then, as I mentioned, strategic, strategic offensive role. In other words, striking strike on the enemy land or enemy base or any enemy force within that country is also the, the role of the United States. And thirdly, and but importantly, the JSDF, Japan Self-Defense Force, is responsible for the strategic defensive role of Japan. So defense of homeland and airspace, and one more important thing, protection of the U.S. forces in and around Japan, and sea control in Japanese waters are the fundamental roles of the Japan Self-Defense Force. And we call this one a shield and spear relationship. U.S. forces acts as, act as a spear, or strategic strike and JSDF act as a shield or protection. And the, the, the next is, you know, the complementary role, especially many nations or some Japanese condemns or complaints about an US-Japan alliance is an unfair one because if the US is attacked, Japan has no obligation to attack the enemy countries of the United States. But the opposite, if Japan is attacked, America is responsible for you know, providing the strategic strike against the enemy soil. So in this con context, you know, the, our alliance looked like unfair. But, you know, the, the, this is a 
kind of a little difficult part for many others to understand. And one thing we have to really understand is U.S. forces or America do not physically defend Japan. As I mentioned, homeland defense or sea lines of communication defense are sole roles of the self-defense force. But U.S. forces are mainly responsible for attack against adversaries' homeland, homeland and war resources to bring on war against at the earliest opportunities. And our, our self-defense force, JSDF, physically defend Japan and sea lines of communications and also provide full operational flexibility of the U.S. forces because U.S. forces are freed from defending Japan, just attack enemy. That's the, the role of the U.S. forces. So U.S. forces operating in and around Japan has a maximum operational flexibilities. And also, one other thing very important for U.S. forces is Japan provides many military bases. And one more thing, more important is ammunition and fuel storages in the front line. And this also enable the U.S. and uh, the militaries to make any type of operations they want. So the in this context, you know, the US and Japan looks unfair, but basically what we call this relationship and complementary relationship. And there is no big problems between in our alliances. And one thing we have to pay attention is this US-Japan alliance is very different from NATO or US-South Korea alliances. Because NATO, you know, the say all nations are re responsible to conduct the equal operations. The same is true the, the Republic US ROC uh, alliances. But Japan basically we defend our country and US attacks and we provide a lot of many you know, the the operational and logistics logistic support to the US forces. And this really form a full opera, fully operational the security postures in this area. Next, please. And as I mentioned, there are several key US bases in Japan and two US Air Force fighting bases or combat bases and two naval bases and one army base and two US marine bases in Japan. And this would form the US forces in Japan. But the both Air Force, US Air Force and US Navy and Marine. Uh, these are a kind of the core strategic striking forces in the U.S. Indo-PACOM. And this is the very important element that the U.S. military has to take into account. Under this complementary, you know, the, the, the mission sharing, this is the example of the ground forces. Of course, there is no U.S. Army forces in Japan, fighting forces in Japan, just logistic support forces and headquarters are located in Japan. So in most of the cases, U.S. Army, if they come to Japan, we will operate a little separately. And JGSDF is the primary force to protect Japan. And you, we expect the U.S. Army to do more important responsibility in outside Japan. That's what we expect. This is the Air Force relationship. The U.S. Air Force stationed in Japan, that's the 5th Air Force. So 5th Air Force is responsible for mainly strategic strike against the enemy soil. Whatever the aggression happens or whatever the military instability happens in this region, and if that develops into the, the real combat, U.S. Air Force in this region is responsible simply for the strategic strike against the enemy. And JASDF, Japan's Air Self-Defense Force, 
is responsible for defense of Japan's airspace or closing air support against the army or ground and maritime self-defense force if necessary. But I think this picture will give you some idea that the, the two missions are totally different and there is no overlapping functions. But Navy, naval cooperation is very different. You know, except the strategic strike and amphibious operations, JMSDF and US 7th Fleet or 3rd Fleet, we have the common operational doctrines or concept. Well, that's what we call the sea control or sea denial functions. So any operations other than strategic strike and amphibious operations, US Navy and JMSDF have been conducting the same operations together in the Northwestern Pacific or protection of the sea lines of communications. So I think this picture gives you a total, total different pictures of from two previous pictures, you know, Army and Navy, Army and the Air Force. There is no overlapping functions, but in the naval area, the, our functions are fully overlapped except the strategic strike and amphib operations. And next, of course, Japan do not single out China as the strategic threats. Of course, we think, especially the self-defense force, think China as the very capable nation, militarily capable nation of concern. So we take the Chinese factor into account in our strategic planning. And there is one thing I do want to specifically mention. That's the Chinese strategic Achilles, Achilles heels that is closely relates with our naval strategy. That's the geocontainment nature and choke points of China. Yes, you know, the, 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 this picture really shows the geographic nature of China. China is a nation of fully contained on the ground and at sea. And especially at sea, there are two closed waters, East China Sea and South China Sea. And Chinese basic area of operations are contained within the lines of the islands or island chains stretching from Korean Peninsula through Japanese Okinawa Islands to Taiwan, to Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Malay Peninsula to Vietnam. <clears throat> so key point is China does not have direct access to either the Pacific Ocean or to the Indian Ocean. The same is true on the ground. And of course, for the Indians, your real point of interest is the, the you know, the border dispute, disputed area in Himalaya. But China is also closed or surrounded by other countries in border. And, you know, the, let me take, uh, use one more slice. You know, this really shows the Chinese nature of the containment. Chinese government or military really hates the, our maneuver, Western maneuvers of the containment, but it's not the Western nations. Geography already contains China. You know, so looking from north to south, for in the East China Sea, China is really contained by the Japanese island chains. And there are several choke points that will really choke the Chinese maneuvers. And one straight, Bashi Strait in between Taiwan and Philippines. And from South China Sea to, to the Pacific or to the Indian Ocean, there are two exit. One is the South of Mindanao Passage, South of in Mindanao Island, we call Mindanao Passage. And another one is the Lombok Strait in the Indonesian waters. But especially for Chinese navies, 
to come to these two choke points, they also have to pass the three inland sea choke points. One is the Mindoro Strait in Philippines, and one is the Shibutu Strait between Philippines and Malaysia, and one is the Makassar Strait in Indonesia. So, for example, Chinese submarine sorting out from Sanya Base in Hainan Island, they have to first transit in, in the South China Sea, then pass through Mindoro Straits, then has to pass, pass through Shibutu Strait, and then go to Mindoro Passage. Oh, one more, Makassar Strait to Lombok Strait. So Chinese military, especially Chinese navies, sending their ships to either Pacific or Indian Ocean will be extremely difficult and troublesome. So this is what I call the Chinese Achilles heels. Let, let, let me touch on our main the naval strategies of Japan. For Japan, or JMSDF, our main strategy is the sea lines of communication protection. So, but what is the sea lines of, of protection of Japanese meaning? One is the maintain the protect the, the, the slots that Japan's maritime traffic depends for national survival. And second is reducing the maritime threats in Northwestern Pacific. And that will contribute the safety arrival of the incoming US forces or US strategic reinforcement from the United States, either Hawaii or mainland across the Pacific. But for two those purposes, one is Japanese survival, and another one is the maintaining the US presence in this region in contingency and wartime. The stock protection will be key for the Japanese survival. So that's why JMSDF put this stock protection as the main strategy of us. And by doing so, we hope, we expect the JMSDF will enable U.S. forces strategic strike against enemy nation by establishing sea control in the Northwestern Pacific. So this is our role. And second is the support to the U.S. forces out of air, area operations. Today, the U.S.-Japan alliance is not simply for the defense of Japan. In the mid 1990s, Japan revised our alliances and added one new missions or meanings on the US-Japan alliances. That's the contribution of the US forces out of the area operations. And Japan will be responsible for the supporting this role. And in case of the, you know, the war in Afghanistan, war against terrorism in Afghanistan, Japan for the first time start sending some ships to provide the, the, the support to the coalition forces. And another one is the global logistics support. Because in this area, US bases in Japan is the only basis to support the US operation, US forces operations in Indo-Pacific. So Japan, or location of Japan is really the front line to support US operations of the US forces. And any military forces needs the logistic support. And without that, militarily, or any fighting forces could be a sitting duck. So global support will be key for the, the flexible US operations. And, Japan will bear the, the responsibility of that part. And th this is uh, other than this, the threat re reduction, or this is the part of the sea lines of communication operations. But for Japan, you know, the, as I mentioned, the, the Chinese Achilles heel is the geographically contained nature. But to maintain this posture, 
Japan has to Japan has to control those choke points in Japanese islands. So for Japan, the defense of those Japanese islands and the controlling the choke points will be the key for the success of the R strategy. Japanese survival and also the enabling the US forces operations, we call that one the sea line and Japanese slope defense. But to really ensure the success of that strategy, these two operations, island defense operations and choke point control operations will be the key for the success. And as I mentioned before, that there are several key points, especially for Chinese operations. But Richard briefly mentioned the, the Quad. But you know, th this is uh, one example. Of course, this is not fully authorized. But if we take the, those locations of the, the choke points and island chain nature of the Chinese containment, geographically con geographical containments, say, quote, nation can develop a kind of the common idea, not binding alliances, common idea for the operations. For example, Japan would be responsible for the, the sea, line, uh, sea control operations in the western part of the Pacific. And Australia will be responsible for the waters between Australia and Indonesia. And if India takes agrees to take and responsibility for maintaining the sea controls out of the exit of the Malacca Strait and Sunda, Sunda Strait and Andaman Nicobar Islands and Sea of Bengal, you know, this will be a kind of the ideal cooperative posture, but less binding. This is an idea. And by showing this posture toward China, I think, or I hope, we'll be able to deter Chinese military adventurism over us or over the region or in the Pacific. So, but, but you know, Quad is still a very ambiguous gathering of the four nations and just four nations agreed to held annual the summit meeting since last year and this year sometime in summer japan will be the hosting nation for the the quad summit so there will be a lot for the national leaders to discuss how the concept and what is the objectives but you know these military nature of security nature of the our cooperation to deter chinese adventurism will be a, i hope the kind of the key for the subject key subject for the some leaders to discuss and national leaders to discuss and the next one is you know the the fleet anti-ship ballistic missile defense as we know understand that China has been very aggressively developing the anti-ship ballistic missile, mainly targeting the US carriers or Japanese big ships or Australian big amphib ships, amphibia ships, and Indian new carriers. So our quad of four nations, especially Japan and India, have to have some capability to protect our capital ships, especially the carriers in India or our SW carriers in Japan from Chinese ballistic missile defense attack. And this is one of the idea for the, our cooperation. Japan and the USA already started our joint ballistic missile defense developments and SM-3 missile will be fully operational in this year. So it is a matter for Japan, India to discuss 
or Japan, India, and USA to discuss at the various stages, including, including summit meetings. But anyway, we do need to make, protect our major naval assets from Chinese anti-ship missile attacks. And if this would be successful, we'll be neutralized Chinese anti-ship missile capabilities. So that's why I'm specifically mentioned this part here. And you know, say so there are two major threats. One is Chinese DF-21D. And the range is about 1,000 nautical kilometers. So DF-21D anti-ship ballistic missile will be a threat mainly for Japan and US forces. But DF-26, the range is 4,000 kilometers. So DF-26 reaches to the mid-Pacific or north of Australia and Andaman Nicobar Islands and the Bay of Bengal. So this is the reason why I'm proposing or you know, I'm really proposing the requirement or needs for Japan, India, and perhaps US, and if US or Australia agrees, coordination should discuss as a common military subject preparing for the Chinese adventurism and deter that adventurism. But this picture gives the, gives you some idea of the importance of the fleet, fleet anti-ship ballistic missile defense. And, you know, say Japan and US, USA, US Navy, JMSDF and Australian Navy are already operating the Aegis destroyers. So I'm not saying that Indian Navy should purchase, but Indian Navy needs some asset to operate the anti-ship ballistic missile systems on board. So this would be a key subject for Indian people and Indian government and Indian Navy to think about that. Okay. And the, the last one is the, of course, in order to really meet Chinese challenges, we have to do many things, especially in high tech areas. One is fleet ballistic missile defense, I already mentioned, or integrated, yeah, and uh, OASW, and seabed AI mines, or remote sensing, five and six 6G communications quantum computing, cyber and AI, seabed, seabed cable protections and others. But these are the new arena we have to play in the future. And Japan, India needs to discuss a lot. And this is not specific to the naval strategies, but this is the key subject that should be included. Our two nations, national security strategy or defense strategies. And, and this is the old picture, Stone Age picture in 2007. This 2007, Japan for the first time participated in the Indian hosted, Indian Navy hosted the Malabar. And since then, especially in last five, six years, Japan is the regular member of participating in the Malabar. But in 2007, there are five nations, India, Japan, USA, and Australia, and one more, the Singapore. And this is the picture taken on board the US carrier and myself, and Indian hosting Admiral, Indian uh, Admiral Sudan, and one Australian Admiral behind. But this is one of my two experiences operated in the Bay of Bengal and also near Andaman, uh, Ocean, uh, Andaman Islands. But this gave me really a best opportunity. But I'll stop here and I'm happy to exchange opinions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Admiral Koda, for a comprehensive lecture on the naval strategy of Japan, uh, especially explaining the key elements of Japanese security strategy and uh, the various alliances that exist and how they function. 
and of course the final picture that you put up i thank you once again for such a wonderful lecture thank you very much